This piece of paper represents money issued by the central bank. But the use of this type of money is quickly dropping as people are more and more using bank cards like this one to buy stuff online and in stores. So now central banks all over the world are introducing so-called central bank digital currency or CBDC, which is a form of digital cash that can live on your phone or on a brand new central bank issued card. But is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, on the one hand, central bankers claim that CBDCs could make digital payments much cheaper and more accessible to vulnerable groups in society, while at the same time making our economies safer and less vulnerable to domination by big or foreign tech firms. On the other hand, there are now also people uh, leading a massive backlash against CBDCs, especially amongst conservatives in the United States. Take for example this clip from Fox News where ex-presidential candidate Tulsi Gabbard says that while the government tells us that This is for your own good. This is for your convenience to make it easier for you to conduct transactions uh, when in fact they are giving themselves all of the power, uh, taking it away from us, undermining our God-given rights and freedoms in the Constitution uh, because they want to be able to control us. They want to be able to control we the people. So, who is right? Are central bank digital currencies going to make our lives easier and safer, or are they a dangerous experiment? To answer this question, I've immersed myself in the arguments of both sides, talking to central bankers in Frankfurt, reading central bank reports about CBDC pilot projects that have already been tested in various countries, um, the ones you can see here on this map, in fact, and I've been contrasting these promising findings with the various concerns around privacy, security, and the potential demise of cash. And after all of that, I've come to the conclusion that the current debate around CBDCs is frankly a hot mess. On the one side, the benefits of CBDCs are still not clear to most people. And on the other side, valid concerns about privacy and financial stability have been drowned out by hyper-sensationalized conspiracy theories. So to find out whether you need a CBDC in your life, let's first dive into the six main arguments that uh, I found in favor of CBDCs and then into the four main arguments against them. Let's first briefly dive into what is wrong with our money today. But before talking about that, I just quickly want to talk about a problem I experienced during my research trips to the European Central Bank in Frankfurt, where I discovered the hard way that my high school German was extremely rusty. And while I know that there are apps for that these days, I was never really able to get into them as they mostly focused on boring grammar and word knowledge. And that is where the sponsor of this video, a language learning app Speakly comes in. You see, Speakly's founders, who both speak seven languages, researched thousands of language learners for six years and based on their experience created a unique method that teaches words and sentences based on their relevance in real life situations and what a real life situation is well that's up to you speakly is the only language learning application that actually lets you choose whether you want to study new vocabulary through writing multiple choice options or both Speakly offers everything you need to learn a language and based on their data, on average, people get from uh, zero skills to solid speaking skills in around three to four months with just 30 minutes of daily learning practice. So if you want to actually use another language fast, then try Speakly for free seven days on either web or mobile and get a 60% discount if you join the annual subscription using the link in the description below. But before doing that, let's talk about what is wrong with our money today. Because the two types of money that we have today, physical central bank money and digital money issued by private banks are both far from perfect. To see why, let's judge how well these types of money score in six different categories. Privacy, accessibility, safety, convenience, online payments and costs using a three star rating system where three stars is a good score and zero stars is a horrible score. Okay, first let's talk about privacy. 
if you pay for something well, using your bank-issued card, then various institutions are potentially getting access to this data. First of all, your bank stores all of this information. And second, card companies like Visa and MasterCard also often keep records of transactions made with your card. Sure, in many cases, this data is never accessed by anyone. However, occasionally both banks and card companies have been caught selling or accidentally leaking data. But perhaps more importantly, governments have easy access to this data as well. That is, if they suspect that you are, for example, avoiding taxes, financing terrorism, or laundering money. So I'd say for privacy, digital bank money gets a one-star score. On the other hand, while cash is almost untraceable, many countries have laws that forbid large cash transactions or require them to be reported to the authorities. So I'd say cash is also not perfect and gets a two-star score for privacy, while noting that actually many people don't mind giving up some privacy to fight crime and terrorism. That being said, I think this striking photo of Hong Kong protesters queuing up to use cash rather than digital public transportation cards reveals that if a country turns authoritarian, people may suddenly really appreciate that physical money is there as an option. Okay, next up is accessibility. As money, cash is extremely accessible. After all, to hold this piece of paper, all you need to do is convince someone to give it to you. However, if you want a card like this one, then you will need to convince a bank that you are who you say you are by presenting your ID and that you are not going to use it to do anything illegal. And while that might not be a problem for most viewers of this channel, research shows that roughly 6% and 30% of the population in advanced and emerging economies respectively does not have access to a bank account. Even more worryingly, there have been quite a few high-profile cases of people getting debanked, meaning that they lost their bank account. For example, in the United States, companies and people whose activities were legal but banks found to be risky, such as sex workers and pot growing, were often refused a bank account. And perhaps even more worryingly, in the United Kingdom, controversial politicians Nigel Farage lost his bank account briefly because his values did not align with that of the bank. And in Canada, the government even forced private banks to freeze the bank accounts of truckers that were protesting against COVID-19 vaccinations. So while private bank accounts are accessible to most, they are not accessible to many people, and there is a legitimate threat of you losing your access to it, leading to a one-star score versus a three-star score for good old cash. However, when it comes to safety, I'd say it's a bit of a toss-up. On the one hand, having a lot of physical money with you is pretty dangerous as it exposes you to theft or losing it. On the other hand, bank fraud is a risk as well. However, as you can see in this picture of people queuing up at their ATM during the Greek financial crisis, if there is a financial crisis, people often rediscover that actually digital private bank money is a promise to pay physical central bank money. So in such a scenario, physical money is way safer. Still, in most cases, both are, let's be honest, pretty safe. So let's just give them both two stars here. <clears throat> but despite that draw, cash is starting to look pretty good, I think, right? So then why are so many of us switching from cash to digital bank money? I mean, I hardly use cash anymore, and depending on where you live, a lot of people seem to feel the same way. For example, check out this graph from the United Kingdom, where you can see that the value of cash payments has declined from 55% in 2012 to only 15% today, while card and other payments have rapidly increased. Why is that? Well, in surveys, people most often mention convenience, which makes sense given that these days using a digital card or app is often just as simple as holding it close to a card machine. No need to count money or worry about change, carry around a large wallet or heading to the ATM all the time. Similarly, if you are a merchant, then collecting digital payments saves you a ton of administrative works and trips to the bank to deposit all of that cash. This is why digital money scores a three-star rating here for convenience versus a single star for physical cash.
Then if we talk about the rise of online businesses, it gets even worse for physical money, given that, well, it's almost impossible to use cash to buy stuff online. And so instead of looking at a person, you are likely to look at a screen like this a lot now, where you have to choose various payment methods to pay the merchant. But why are some payment methods featured more prominently here than others? Well, as a small business owner, I can tell you that it has to do with the final money consideration, and that is costs. Where the reason that, for example, PayPal is often so low on your screen is that they charge ridiculous fees to merchants. Still, when it comes to cost, I think that it's a bit of a toss-up between um, physical and digital money. As uh, a consumer, you probably don't think it matters since both you know, digital and cash payments appear to be free. However, from the merchant side, they most definitely are not free. After, after all, cash needs to be stored safely, administered and deposited at a bank every now and then. And all of that is actually quite expensive. On the flip side, a merchant does also pay a small fee to banks and card companies every time that you swipe your card. And so you can be sure that actually as a consumer, you are probably paying slightly higher prices because merchants have these payment costs. So, okay, having compared our two current forms of money, it has become clear that they both have their advantages and disadvantages, which has led us to a point where Fewer and fewer people are using cash, and yet still in surveys, they say that they do really appreciate the option that cash is around. But in another recent survey from the UK, it also became clear that consumers are not entirely happy with this current setup of having to choose between the privacy of cash payments and the convenience of digital payments. And that is where CBDCs come in. Although, before discussing how CBDCs can make our lives better, there are two crucial pieces of context that we need to talk about first. The first is that actually central bank digital currencies are not new. In most economies, the central bank already issues a digital currency besides cash. However, this CBDC, also known as a wholesale CBDC, is not accessible to the public. It is only available to banks who use it to pay each other. And so the discussion that follows will be about the so-called retail CBDC, which will be accessible to the public as public digital payment option, complementing physical money and private bank digital money. The second piece of context that you really need to know about first is that a CBDC is a technology that can be implemented in many different ways. Of course, it can be implemented in a highly authoritarian way, which we will talk about later in this video, but actually many of the current proposals in countries like the United States, the United Kingdom and Europe have more in common with what the OECD calls CBDCs with democratic values, of which the main aim is to make the lives of citizens better rather than to increase government control. So, what are the advantages of CBDCs with democratic values? Well, after going through a ton of proposals and research, I've come across six main arguments in favor of adding a CBDC to our current payment mix. The first proposed advantage of CBDCs is that it can be more private than digital bank money, and depending on which country you are in, perhaps even as private as cash. So, how will these CBDCs be more private than private digital money? Well, first by cutting out the card companies. Uh, and that means that there is now one less party that can sell or leak your data. Second, well, in most proposals, uh, private banks will actually keep managing your money through these CBDC wallets and they will store the transaction data instead of the central banks themselves they won't have free access to that data unless they receive a government request. More importantly, in most proposals, the central bank, which will handle transactions, will not be allowed to save information that can tie these transactions to you as a person. So CBDCs with democratic values are actually more private than digital bank money because it cuts out access by private parties while keeping government access the same. Although actually in some cases, such as the digital euro proposal, if you used it offline on your phone, your transactions will be more private. Even better, in Nigeria, which recently launched a CBDC, 
you can buy CBDC cards that are almost completely anonymous and that can only hold small sums of money, making it equally private as cash for small transactions. And yes, on the flip side, that means that petty corruption or small criminal transactions are also still possible with such a CBDC. So depending on the exact proposal, a democratic CBDC would score a two or even three star ratings for privacy. Next, when it comes to accessibility, imagine that indeed we do get this offline CBDC or anonymous cards that you could just buy in the store. This would really make a digital currency more accessible than a private digital bank money that we have today. Indeed, increasing accessibility has been one of the main drivers to introduce CBDCs in emerging market economies. For example, the first retail CBDC to ever be introduced, the Bahamas Cent Dollar, was introduced with accessibility in mind, as they explain in their promotional video. In many of our remote communities, there is very limited access to financial services on a daily basis. It helps those unbanked members of our population who don't have access to commercial banking facilities. But does a CBDC also protect people from being unbanked for their political views? You'd think it would not. However, in their proposal for CBDCs with democratic values, the OECD writes that universal equal accessibility for all citizens to a digital version of sovereign currency are both prerequisites. For this to happen, no undue restrictions should be imposed related to user profiles and or conditions to the use of CBDCs by any and all citizens. In other words, a democratically designed CBDC could in theory protect people like Nigel Farage from being unbanked for having different political values, giving it a three-star rating. Okay, next, let's talk about safety. Remember that cash is the ultimate safe asset in a crisis and digital bank money is less likely to be stolen or lost. Well, a CBDC could actually combine both of these traits and so it could score a three star rating here, better than both cash and digital private bank money. On the other hand, for convenience and online shopping, a CBDC does not bring anything new to the table and would be just as good as private digital money. So then let's move on to the fourth advantage of CBDCs and that is that they should make our lives cheaper, which as we have discussed is a bit of a hidden advantage since currently the costs of paying with both cash and private bank money falls mostly on merchants and are therefore hidden to consumers. So how will a CBDC make your life cheaper? Well, the idea is that by cutting out the middlemen like Visa and MasterCard, central bank digital currency payments could be quite a bit cheaper for merchants who now face transaction costs sometimes up to 3.5%. And these cost savings could be even bigger for those of us that sometimes send money across borders. For example, to go on vacation or to the business or to send money home to your family. The reason for this is that just like with local bank transfers, a specialized messaging company that charges high fees is needed to make all of this work behind the scenes. And to make this all even worse, banks often use more intermediaries such as correspondent banks in big financial centers like New York or London to make the foreign exchange transactions work behind the scenes, meaning that there will be even more fees. So in response, Several central banks have recently been running trials with so-called cross-border CBDCs, which is a fancy way of saying that they have experimented with giving foreign banks access to their wholesale CBDCs. For example, in Project Dunbar, Australia, uh, South Africa, Malaysia and Singapore worked together to give their banks access to the CBDCs of each other. So, for example, in this project, an Australian bank could hold digital uh, rands at the South African Reserve Bank and a South African bank could hold digital Australian dollars at the Reserve Bank of Australia. Therefore, if a South African wine exporter now wanted to export wine to Australia, its bank could just directly receive rands from the client's bank in Australia. And in the current model, this transaction between banks would likely have gone through intermediaries in New York or London, hence being quite a bit more expensive. 
So CBDCs could make regular transactions slightly cheaper and they could make international transactions a lot cheaper, meaning that a three star rating is in order here, I think. And as you might have noticed, we have now arrived at the part where we will talk about some new stuff because the fifth proposed advantage of CBDCs is that it is supposed to give countries a geopolitical advantage. After all, as Russia has recently found out the hard way, relying on the dominant banking systems of other countries can be quite risky. After all, if global payments run through foreign banking systems, then you can be excluded from those systems. Actually, geopolitics has been a major argument for the European Central Bank to introduce the Digital Euro project, as its president, Christine Lagarde, explained in this leaked clip. The reason I'm personally convinced that we have to move ahead is a situation like the one we are in now. We are mm -hmm. dependent on the supply of gas by a, a very unfriendly country. Mm -hmm. I don't want Europe to be dependent on an unfriendly country's currency. For instance, I don't know, you know, the Chinese mm -hmm. currency, the Russian currency, the mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. or dependent on a friendly currency, but which is activated by a private corporate entity like, you know, Facebook or like uh, Google or anybody like. So by moving people to a CBDC payment system, countries potentially also unlock more geopolitical safety than relying on foreign financial institutions. And with that, we've arrived at the final potential advantage of CBDCs, which is that they have the potential to revolutionize money through so-called programmable money or tokenized money. You see, in some proposals, CBDCs make use of similar technologies that cryptocurrencies use today which will actually allow users to automate money. So for example, if you buy a house now with normal money, normal bank money, then you typically pay a substantial fee to a third party to hold that money in escrow, ensuring that the seller gets the money once the key to the house is handed over to you. The advantage of a programmable CBDC would be that you can automate this process, thereby making it cheaper and easier. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. Central bankers imagine that by giving private firms access um, to their CBDC API, a vibrant new ecosystem can emerge that provides innovative payment solutions based on conditional payments that make payments easier, safer, and cheaper across the world. So yeah, that's it. CBDCs with democratic values that complement cash and complement private bank money can theoretically make your life much more private, easier, safer, quite a bit cheaper, especially if you move money across borders, and it could make your country safer, geopolitically speaking, and revolutionize its financial system. However, as you might now say, Yuri, it's pretty naive of you to assume that CBDC that we end up with will be a CBDC with democratic values. Indeed, there are also people like Fox News contributor, Dr. Monica Crowley, who believes that. The bottom line here is not ease or convenience. That's how they're going to sell it, right? The ultimate objective is to move us to a cashless society. So you will no longer have that hard asset of that $20 bill or $10 bill. Your money will essentially be software. It will be a number in a program that the Fed, Treasury, the government, your political opponents will all have access to. They eventually want to get rid of most banks. Now, the, the big ones are too big to fail. But in the end, the ultimate objective is to essentially wipe all of the banks out so that your bank will be the Federal Reserve. Everything will be centralized. And again, this is not really about the money, although of course it is. This is about power and control because the government, such as it is, will have access to all of the information related to every single transaction you make. You buy a stick of gum, the government will know. You buy a new car, the government will know. Oh, you bought the wrong car. You didn't buy an EV. Now you're going to get penalized. And while it may be easy to dismiss this as just another conspiracy, I did actually watch many of these types of videos and discovered that they brought up a lot of good points. Let's talk about the four big dangers of CBDCs. 
First, before we get into the truly dystopian stuff, economists and politicians have voiced two important concerns about a poorly designed CBDC. First, given that governments don't have a great track record of implementing good software, a poorly designed CBDC could be so clunky and bad that it ends up being less accessible than private digital money. Second, by offering a very safe digital asset, some economists have argued that the central bank could actually make bank runs more likely, thereby decreasing the safety of the monetary system. However, a simple counterargument to these points would of course be that recent successes in India have shown that governments can actually build an online payment system that people love and that financial stability concerns can be limited if people can only hold small sums of CBDC money as has been proposed in, for example, Europe and the United Kingdom. But what is less easily dismissed is that while a CBDC can be used to improve the lives of citizens, it can of course, also be used to increase the control of a government over its population. To get to the root of this fear, let's quickly go back to that photo of protesters in Hong Kong that want to travel to the site of the protest with cash. In this case, it is clear that cash helped people to voice their concerns about increasing authoritarianism. And now, China is one of the countries that is at the forefront of developing a CBDC and many experts now indeed fear that its motivation is actually to move to a cashless society and increased levels of social control. And so, yeah, if that is true, then it makes total sense that people worry that every CBDC will be used like that. Because indeed, unlike a democratic CBDC, a CBDC with an authoritarian design would be far less private than cash and potentially also less private than private bank money. And to make matters worse, in this case, programmable money could allow governments to do weird and wonky stuff like giving us money that can only be spent on certain things. Or they can control, as, as, the, as, uh, as we talked about in the report, whether you can buy a firearm, how much gas you can buy, how much electricity you can buy. Can you buy meat or do you have to buy bug-based meat? And to make matters even more controversial, the Chinese CBDC pilot project included money that could expire something that could make economic stimulus much more effective as it guarantees stimulus checks will actually be spent. But as critics pointed out, if your money can expire and therefore you have to spend it, this certainly reduces your freedom. So yeah, programmability when used for authoritarian purposes can potentially limit the benefits of a CBDC for the population, reducing its score to two stars. And to be fair, central bankers in democratic countries have also discussed the possibilities of CBDCs that can expire or only be spent on certain things. However, at the same time, I do have to mention here that while this sounds really scary, expirable money or money that can only be spent on certain things already exists today and we know it under the far less scary name of a voucher. And that brings us to my conclusion, which is that I think that the main question, whether CBDCs are good or bad, is in fact wrong. The question should be, how do we end up with a good CBDC? And there, while sometimes presented in an overly sensationalized way, the main concerns that have been voiced are, in my opinion, really valid. And actually, the fact that these concerns have been voiced so loudly has already had a really positive impact as central banks have been listening and some of them, like the European Central Bank, have updated their proposals to reflect these concerns, moving their proposed CBDC closer to the CBDC with democratic values that I think most people would prefer. Specifically, the proposal for the digital euro now includes pseudo-anonymous offline payments and is Packed with a legislation that aims to safeguard the role of cash, ensure it's widely accepted as a means of payment and remains easily accessible for people and businesses across the euro area. And yet, while this made me much more positive about CBDCs, I hope that all of you will remain critical so that we end up with a CBDC that improves our lives rather than helping our governments to control it which luckily I think for many of us is really likely. After all, there have been many new governments owned technologies ranging from railroads to tanks to television that have made some dictatorships more powerful and yet have not led 
every country that adopted these technologies to become an authoritarian dystopia. Instead, what has protected these countries from government overreach in the past has more often been about rules, regulations and institutions that are separate from the government and which hold the government accountable. But yeah, that is my take. Um, what do you think? Should we have a public form of digital money that lives alongside cash and alongside private digital money? Or do you think that digital money should purely be left in the hands of for-profit banks and car companies? Let me know in the comments below. And if you like this type of deep dive into current events, consider supporting my work by buying me a digital coffee or by supporting the channel long term as a member or patron. And finally, if you want to know more about CBDCs, consider checking out my interview with the ECB about the digital euro over here, or this video from Into Europe also about the digital euro over here.